Fitzroy Crossing is a township in the Fitzroy Valley and it's uh, the main feature around this country is the river which floods every year and uh, this time of the year being August it gets a bit dry and brown. We get it roughly about 100 days in a row, over 40 degrees here. And that goes right up until December and then the monsoon rains start coming in and we get the bottom end of the monsoon rains. And that's what fills up the big catchment up at north of us on the other side of the King Leopold Ranges. And then the whole valley is revitalised by that water that comes down here. So then all this country just goes green again and all the smells change and it becomes all beautiful. And this Fitzroy River is the biggest river in Australia. And uh, at its peak it does over 30,000 cubic metres per second output going past the new bridge down here. I really loved the place when it was just an outpost, you know, 30, 40 years ago. It's changing pretty rapidly. There's a big influx of tourists in the tourist season, and, but she's still a, you know, good little place. The thing I love about this place is wide open spaces and the river and, and the gorge and a big, uh, a freedom, as I am one of the uh, traditional owners of Kiki Gorge. Kiki Gorge is known to the Bunaba people as Dangu. Kiki Gorge is only a white man name. It's got a lot of stories there. When the explorers sort of came through, there have been like a massacre there at the gorge. To this day, you can see those bones in those caves, but. We don't let anybody go in there. Stark, vast, you know, isolated, um, beautiful colours, and, and the big Fitzroy River when she when she flows through in the wet season is pretty incredible. One of the people are the traditional owners for all the areas around the town site of Fitzroy Crossing and going back west towards Derby, a place called Winyana Gorge is just about at the edge of our traditional grounds. And in Fitzroy Crossing there's uh, four language groups, uh, two from the desert, Walmijeri and Wangajunga. And then to the east of Fitzroy Crossing is Guniandi, going right, right up near Halls Creek. I'm standing beside the memorial cairn of the old AIM hospital. The hospital was a two-storey building and we catered for um, mainly Aboriginal people who lived in the area and we had uh, four um, nurses and we employed uh, three or four Aboriginal workers to help us with the housework type things and the cooking because um, none of us knew how to make bread. Uh, at that time there was no resident doctor. Uh, the dentist lived in Kununurra and came around at races time because he liked the races and set up his chair in our uh, medical room and did dental work while he was here in between races which was quite funny. Uh, they're filming me at uh, crossing in hotel uh, where I was born and the building you're looking at in the background here is the old store uh, it's a bit like a general store and a lot of the buildings now have been sort of um, either pull, pulled down or been washed away by flood when you look at it now it's really a lot tougher than it is these days I reckon people are pretty spoiled but um, yeah, we certainly put in long days and it was all horseback and the mules carted most of our swags and tucker. I hardly ever drank, you know, now and again you'd get one sniff of the barmaid's open and you'd be, you'd be on your ear, but things have changed. Whether you're a white kid or a black kid, a lot don't really want to put in that, the hard yards anymore. Well, I'm standing in the ruins of the old uh, Native Welfare Superintendent's yard. It was developed as a mission from about 1950s onwards, but prior to that, for about 20 years, it was a native welfare settlement, primarily set up to be a refugee camp for the people coming out of the Great Sandy Desert, the old Bushmen and that. When they lobbied for award wages for the stockmen and domestic workers on the stations, and a lot of the station managers kicked all the people off the properties, and they got evicted, and this was the main refuge for them. This is the old Fitzroy Crossing post office and it closed down in 1980. The post office was important to the town 
because our mail came in by aeroplane and was sorted and this was our main means of communication. And uh, you know, if you're expecting some parcels, the postmaster would know all about it, where it came from, what might be in it. They also had a public phone box. This public phone here at the post office was only our um, immediate contact with the outside world. We're now at um, the old low level crossing, the old bridge. During the flood, it's always been cut off. There have been a lot of accidents in the past, cars and trucks getting washed off the bridge. We see all these caravan coming down. They start floating on the water and everything is lost, you know. Yeah, there were a lot of accidents in those days. Now we are right at the old Fitzroy Crossing police station. And out the back they had uh, the lock-up and the black trackers quarters where they lived in an old kitchen which is still there. We worked in very close with the police at the hospital, so if ever we were in trouble or we needed help or shifting a, a body, um, going out to the airstrip in the middle of the night for the RFDS flight, they would be with us. Where you see me now standing is um, the footbridge and we're standing above uh, where the Brooking Creek runs. And we just come here and sit down and do fishing, catch barra and black brim and catfish and things like that. And we used to swim all the time, you know, every day we used to swim like from morning right through to five o'clock at night. Now over the wet, there were very few of the JPs left, but there was one fellow, he was called Six Months Harry, because if he had to squelch through mud that went above his ankles, the police would say to themselves, well, has everyone caught this morning or get six months? If they did six months, they had to go down to Broome and he'd say, brother, I'm sending you for a seaside holiday. My first few years, well, the, especially the first season, that was all, I was the only white kid with, um, in the camp, but everybody looked after us and you, and you, um, you grow up and you, you try never to be racist in your, in your outlooks on things, you know. A lot of other people got displaced off their traditional grounds and for them it's been a very struggle because they can't talk on this country here and so they don't have any very strong identity or links to their country and it's only been in the last sort of 15 years that they've eventually got their country back either as a pastoral lease or living areas. I love the land and, and I can see where people come from. If you're off a property, off, off a certain area of land and you love it, you've always got that attachment. You know? It's like a farmer but more so over centuries and centuries with one race of people. You know, you must, you, you do, you, you have a real attachment. Uh, we have an organisation called Buna Beings. Uh, we've developed a building crew in recent years to start rebuilding our own houses. And you can see a couple here behind me. And a lot of our families want to sort of move out of the big community that was set up in the 1970s and come back and live in their own family groups. There was a great sense of camaraderie if you think there was a, a large Aboriginal population around and at those days we were all sort of still learning to live together as two different cultures and um, I mean, there have been bad times along the way but I think, um, you know, over the years we're getting there. We have a strong identity to our land and we have to look after this country. But uh, yeah, I just love this country. It's, um, I guess they'll put me under a bow tree somewhere up here.